US, Middle East. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone uh, there as well. Now, um, today we're focusing on uh, pediatric spine, and uh, I have my uh, great friend uh, and excellent colleague, uh, Dr. Siamak Zaresti. He's from the Royal Perth Hospital, as well as private practice in Western Australia. Um, for those that uh, that know, uh, you know, West Australia is uh, uh, basically like a, as big as Texas, and it sits out in the west of Australia. It's a couple of uh, hours flight from where I am uh, in Adelaide, and uh, they've got uh, a, a population of what, about three million, CMAC, that so you look after there? Uh, yeah, three million, whole WA. About three million, yeah, about three million people, and uh, and CMAC looks after a lot of the kids there with uh, neuromuscular scoliosis. Uh, he's also uh, trained with uh, Professor Malati in France, uh, who has a really innovative technique that's been around for a little while, and I first saw this paper come up in, uh, in Spine in about 2018, of his first hundred cases of using a, a less invasive technique for treatment of neuromuscular scoliosis that they call the bipolar technique. Uh, and uh, CMAX personally trained in this with Malati. So I thought it'd be great to get his perspective on it and how it's been working for him in his practice. Um, I just wanted to run down uh, a case um, of mine um, that I had, and this is when I, I work mainly in private hospitals now, so I don't get the opportunity to treat CP kids that much anymore, but this was a, a young girl who was eight, uh, GMFCS4. She did ambulate short distances, but was mainly in a wheelchair for longer distances. She really enjoys getting on the floor and, and moving and playing. And a lot of these kids do that. She has some hip dysplasia that's being regularly monitored. These were her presenting curves at around the age of eight. Um, and only sort of half a year later, she ended up with this type of curve. So this obvious progression to 75 odd degree lumbar curve um, with increasing pelvic obliquity, um, slightly kyphotic, but not really kyphotic. And so at age eight, we're faced with a real challenge here. It's a very small eight year old. Uh, and you've got a few options, of course. I mean, you can plug away with conservative treatment. Uh, people try the second skin, which is this neoprene type brace. Uh, I find that it's not that effective for big curves. Uh, chair modifications, all those things are done. Um, and ultimately, you're looking at surgery for a kid like this. And, and do you do a definitive fusion on a small eight-year-old that's almost nine? You know, or do you do, and if you do that, do you go to the pelvis? Do you finish at L5? You know, there is some downsides of going to the pelvis, which include, you know, I've found that it can take a borderline ambulator to a non-ambulator. So we always have to consider that. Or do you do a growing rod construct? This is what I ended up doing for her in 2017. So this is where I got her with some magic rods, uh, minimally invasive surgery in some ways in that they're tunneled under the skin. There's a short fusion from T2 to T4 at the top and L4-5 at the bottom. And this has been her over the years. So she's maintained reasonable curve control. We've pretty much hit maximum length on the magic rods. She's had some other orthopedic surgery to lower limbs. It was quite complicated. And it's made me very hesitant to ever go back in there. So six years down the line, this is where we're sitting with the film uh, on the right. And you know, she's still got some curves there that have sort of progressed a bit underneath those rods. But she's sitting balanced, pelvic ubiquity is controlled. Magic rods surprisingly haven't broken. And it leaves me now in a conundrum because there is a recommendation to potentially take these devices out due to metallosis. Uh, but I suspect that she also has a degree of definitive autofusion across there. And at the moment, we've made a, a sort of family and a team-led decision to not proceed with anything further at this stage. So that's my case, and that's how I managed this one many years ago. But I think if I, I had the bipolar available, I probably would have looked at that instead for this case. But CMAC's going to take us through that, and um, I'll stop sharing and hand over to him. Oh, no, thank you very much, Mike. Let me get going. Um, thanks, Dr. Selby and the rest of the Global Spinal team for asking me to present. My name is Sia Maxeresti. I'm an orthopedic spinal surgeon. Uh, I practice in WA Western Australia, many in uh, pediatric and also adult spinal surgery. Uh, I've been asked to talk about bipolar technique, which I've learned in my fellowship in France. So I'll quickly go through the technique, but uh, beforehand, uh, don't have anything for disclosure. 
Uh, I touched down on the scoliosis types, which obviously we know of the three um, types. The most common one is cerebral palsy and also uh, the SMA one, which is coming to play because of the new sinusin and the new deal of developed medication that is uh, actually helping to live longer. Um, in terms of natural history, neuromuscular scoliosis, unfortunately, uh, is rapidly progressive scoliosis. It's very stiff. And the other highlight of this type of scoliosis is uh, to produce pelvic obliquity. Pelvic obliquity causes uh, sitting imbalance and also pelvic, spinal pelvic junction impingement, or costal pelvic impingement, which can uh, cause further troubles, such as respiratory dysfunction, feeding problem, and they really struggle to lose, to gain weight. Uh, traditionally, uh, we've been trying to manage scoliosis uh, especially for early onset and adolescent idiopathic through casting for conservative management. But unfortunately, that doesn't work in neuromuscular type of scoliosis because of patient's compliance and also stiffness of the curve, which usually makes the casting and also embracing pretty much futile. Uh, in terms of surgical management or when to operate, there's still a debate. Some people would like to wait till the kit grow um, enough that they can fuse the whole spine with one operation. The other um, idea is to allow the growth, but you still don't know when to start to intervene. Um, my approach is uh, anyone uh, older than eight or seven or eight, and anyone with uh, weight over 25 kilogram uh, could be a surgical candidate. Um, and obviously they should have the coronal imbalance. So the sitting is not upright. All I want to provide to the kid and the family is having a nice sitting child and that has a liver shoulder and also liver pelvis. Surgical options, well, obviously before we jump into surgery, we do have a multidisciplinary team approach. Definitely they need to have nutritional, pulmonary and anesthetic assessment before any operation. Um, but in terms of surgical technique in, in itself, uh, fusion is the most common, commonly used technique in around the world. Um, the other techniques, such as gross sparing ones, are either traditional growing rod or magic, the example that uh, Dr. Selby just um, showed us an example. The other technique I use is uh, called NEMOS bipolar, which I go through in detail. Um, this is the, just a picture of how uh, big the operation would be for a standard fusion surgery in neuromuscular scoliosis. And the main reason for a trouble with this kind of operation uh, would be the complication they can have. Uh, the main and the worrisome complication would be the infection. And that actually affects the quality of life and actually makes us regret doing the operation in the first place. Um, other uh, uh, complications such as bleeding uh, or rod breakages or non-union are also a part of the reason I try to stay away from the arthrodesis. Uh, traditionally, we've been trying different types of gross sparing techniques, um, including magic. Uh, the problem with that would be uh, either anchorage into the pelvis is not as strong, because um, I'm a big believer for neuromuscular scoliosis to go to the pelvis. And also the growth technique or growing technique we use, um, they have their own uh, dilemmas and failures, especially with magic, uh, apart from uh, metallosis, uh, the fracture of the rod is also a big problem, which so far I have not had any with the neumus bipolar. And the technique I want to talk about is, uh, we call it minimally invasive because uh, we don't open up the whole spine. Um, we just open up the bottom to put the anchorage into the pelvis and the top part uh, to put our hooks. It usually provides good sitting balance. Uh, we try to avoid any scarring in between and uh, the complication rates such as infection is a lot lower than the standard uh, neuromuscular scoliosis surgeries. Uh, the technique essentially is about how to put the anchorage in the bottom. It's called tannet or iliosacral screw. We do connect it, uh, grab the screw, and at top, we use the hook instead of the screws. We use two pedicle hook and supralaminar hook. And right in between, uh, either we just use a traditional rod or we use a growing technique called um, NEMOST. I um, show you the schematic view. So, 
I tend to stay from, from the uh, subacrastic junction. So I usually start at T2, but uh, the way I was told and learned by Dr. Milati was from T1 to pelvis. At the top, we um, go with the superlaminar hook. At T2 is infralaminar or pedicular hook. There's a cross link in between them. And then we uh, skip T3, go to T4 and T5, and you repeat the same sequence, superlaminar and infralaminar or pedicular hook. Uh, at the bottom, uh, we use the tenet, which is essentially is all a sacral screw. But the only difference is we have a connector that actually screw goes through it. And that creates a very strong construct in the bottom that we can rely on that for the distraction between the hook on the top and the tenet in the bottom. I use intraoperative um, neuromonitoring and also intraoperative traction. I use a, a halo for the uh, skull and also skin traction for the lumbar spine and also the lower limbs. I use asymmetrical traction and I put more traction in the concavity to allow me um, to have a better reduction of the uh, scoliosis intraoperatively. Uh, that's the schematic view of the screw and the connector um, that the screw going through. Uh, essentially, we try to create about a centimeter um, a hole through the uh, um, L5S1 facet joint just underneath and above the S1 foramen. And that's for the connector that will grab the screw going through the pelvis. Uh, we use a jig, that's for um, freehand and also with navigation, we use that. That will try angulate to where put the screw in from the um, ileum to sacrum, and this is all done percutaneously. Uh, this is a, a picture of Dr. Milady operating in France and they using freehand technique with the diapason type uh, device to help them um, to put the wire in and then the uh, tap and follow what is screw to follow. I use navigation in WA, the different system of navigation we use. I tend to use the 7D navigation based on the preoperative imaging. I do my planning. Uh, with my planning, I try to exactly know where I put my connector and also the ILS across screw and usually makes a very streamlined uh, procedure. And the, I would say the easiest part of the operation is actually putting the screw with the navigation. Uh, that shows part of my planning. That's the oligosacral screw going from the ileum to sacrum. This is uh, actually a connector, which is a hole provided to be 90 degrees perpendicular to the oligosacral screw. That will actually grab it, and there's a set of screw going through this and will lock this, and that will create a completely solid construct. Uh, that's the exposure usually enough to uh, put the oligosacral screw, but also more importantly, and uh, the distal part of the device, which is the NEMOS rod that I'll show you later. Uh, I'll quickly go through the navigation, which obviously anyone used either Brain Lab or 7D is uh, registering with three points. Uh, connector, uh, we uh, then try to navigate an instrument first, and then the other security screw. This is just a checkpoint of make sure the screw going through the pelvis. And also, I'll uh, do the x ray at the end. And that's in pretty much a picture I would like to get. Um, after that, the hook and construct on the top is a superlaminar and infrapedicular hook. We don't use the screws at the top unless the hook fails, and the rest of the construct comes into play to put a rod in. I use a small rod on the um, top, and there's a connecting rod or the third rod coming. So this is a traditional technique which I, uh, has been modified since. And uh, this is a NEMOS construct. NEMOS is essentially a ratcheted growing device, which is one direction of sliding rod. Comes into different sizes, 50 and 80 millimeter. I usually use 80 because I start at very early age, like an eight or nine year old, and they have a lot of growth potential to go through. That's also another picture of the NEMOS construct with the ratcheted uh, lengthening device. These are the examples of the cases I've done. Um, that's a pre and post. This is a traditional rod. As you can see, is um, hooks at the top, other suffer in the bottom, um, and it, the standard rod in between. And we just use the cross connector and cross link to lock them. And uh, this kit was about 12 uh, year old girl. So I did one operation. That's 
not a fusion is uh, essentially an instrumentation and um, I did not have to go back into Langston. Since that, uh, I've been doing NEMAS, which is a self growing rod. I'll show you now the pictures how NEMAS work, which is essentially a very simple construct. The same thing we do is a, a proximal hook, histal screws, and we connect them with the self growing rod. So it's one operation usually, and we don't need to go back into lengthen them. That's another picture of the uh, NEMAS construct in a 14 year old boy in CPT. And this picture essentially shows what I'm talking about when I say ratchet. That's the immediate post off. And you can see in about three months post operatively, that's the distance that the spine actually grown. And if we zoom in, I'll zoom in here for you. And that's the ratchet that uh, this NEMAS keep um, clicking essentially and grow as the patient grow, and as the um, parents lift up the patient. Yes, yeah, CMAC, I was uh, sorry to interrupt. I was going to yeah, ask no, you, know, that, that, with the uh, ratcheting mechanism, it seems to me a bit like an apifix as well. And um, it does require a degree of lift from parents or carers just to get body weight to help ratchet that out. Exactly. So, if, if with yeah. any lifting, it actually grow, but also the um, you know, natural growth of the child also encourage that ratchet. And they very quickly grow and readjust re themselves as well. And I, I find it quite rewarding um, with the patients that they don't need to go back in. You don't need to worry about the magic, metallosis, and breakages. And so far, so good touch wood. I didn't have any major complications with that. Um, I've been doing I've, I've been doing up to 15 cases so far. Um, these are just uh, the paper that uh, I think it was the first paper that Humilati published. Uh, he had um, uh, he's done over 100 and 150 cases. And they had a few complications initially with the rod breakages infection. Uh, since they changed to NEMOS, they, I've been told they've had, they have had no major um, rod breakages. Um, to me, doing this operation mainly is to um, uh, have a, a shorter operative period uh, and also less blood loss. And so far, been a, a less infection rate for me um, because infection would be the main game changer for neuromuscular scoliosis. We essentially want to give him a good a quality of life with better sitting balance. Um, these are in, in the other pictures of um, in Dr. Milady's um, paper. They do that in the Walker neuromuscular scoliosis. I haven't done that in the Walkers yet, or many doing that in the wheelchair bound um, uh, CP kits. And uh, this is where the actual NEMOS or bipolar cancer have been used in the world, apart from Europe, uh, UK, uh, part of the uh, Africa, been used in Australia, Japan, and Brazil. And in, in my opinion and conclusion, um, it, this is another technique that I've been learned and went through in my fellowship. So far, it's been very, very rewarding for me. Uh, the main difference in this technique to others would be the simplicity, um, being minimally invasive, less blood loss, and also I use a very strong um, pelvic fixation construct that does not have um, any major complication related to um, length of the surgery or difficulty putting the uh, instrument in. And at the same time, uh, a lot of gross without the other complications so far we had to deal with. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, ask any question if there's any. See, Mac, do you mind uh, winding back a bit? I'm just showing a couple of the cases there with the uh, hook construct at the top where you focused on it. Yeah, that one looks good, right? Yeah. So I, I you know, we, uh, uh, spine surgery keeps going around and around in circles, right? And, um, you know, per, first people to put in uh, thoracic pedicle screws were, uh, uh, sort of pariahs for a while right and now we do it routinely and so people will look at this and go well why are you using hooks at the top why are we going back to that so what do you think is important as part of that sort of hook claw technique you've got going on there um, so my personal opinion would be um because when i came back for fellowship i had a couple of hook failures intraoperatively that revised like maybe one or two hooks to a screw but uh, i would say hooks are very forgiving um uh, various screws are very, very solid and robust in terms of once you've done that and put your rod in, they lock in 
they actually have no give. And the failure actually is higher with the screws rather than the hook. Because with the hook, you still have a bit of a very micro motion and flexibility that let the body to readjust itself. I, I don't think anyone can provide the best sagittal corner balance for these kids. We try to get them the best um, alignment interoperatively and get them off the table. But I think having that hook itself, uh, it really allows for the body to a little bit readjust itself in the construct. That's my theory. But the other theory is um, the hooks are a little bit quicker to put in. Um, and to be honest, I haven't had many any major neurological uh, issue or uh, such as um, CSF leak or dural tear or anything with that. Um, the only issue with the hook I had was the full bone quality can happen even with the screw and um, hook pull out, which was intraoperatively and I quickly changed them to the screw. But in terms of why they do that, well, that's the French uh, ideology is still kept that tradition to use hooks for traffic. But for me, it's, um, our, our thing is mainly the bit of a give and flexibility that hook has rather than screw that uh, allow the self-adjustment. Yeah, it seems to me that this system works because there's motion in it. Um, Mike, can I yeah, chime in and that... ask a quick question? Yeah, of okay. course. So. Okay, thanks so much. Dr. Tresti, th thanks for that uh, presentation. Uh, uh, if there's time, I'll show a couple of slides at the end. This brings back some memories from a few years ago, as I was mentioning before we started. Uh, one question I had for you is, you know, as, as you can tell and as you know, um, this construct, which is less invasive but very effective, doesn't um, doesn't provide really the same degree or extent of correction that we, uh, you know, we uh, here on this side of the Atlantic like to see with the pedicle screw and rod constructs. Yeah, you know, we we really like straight spines, especially with these uh, uh, yeah. with these neuromusculars. The, you know, the real question is 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 you know, what's your take on on how much in, you know how much is enough, right? How much degree correction do we really want or do these patients and these kids really need? I know we all strive for these perfect straight spines, but these, these constructs are not providing that. But so is that even really necessary? So more of a philosophical question on what what how much correction do you think really is adequate and needed in this patient population? Um, for me, essentially, neuromuscular population are different to uh, adolescent idiopathic. Uh, most of the patients are non-verbal. They can communicate. All the parents and patients' problem is they can't sit upright and they just want to have the quality of life being able to sit up. Um, and what this uh, construct does is create a relatively balanced pelvis and a shoulder. I mean, I can easily get a um, level pelvis and a level shoulder in this patient and the care, whatever happens in between, I don't think either I do really, really care about or even the patients or parents. They're not after a straight spine. They're after if patients have a better sitting posture and a quality of life. And we can easily provide that with uh, having a very strong constraint in the pelvis and also at the top in the thoracic with a bit of a distraction. But back to your question, I don't think I'm, I'm chasing a straight spine because as you said, I'm not instrumenting the middle. So it's gonna be very hard by just distraction, the same method that, um, Harrington was trying to um, do to get a straight spine. Whereas here, I get a straight pelvis or level pelvis and a level shoulder. And um, whatever happens in between, I don't think that affects patient's quality of life. That, that's my own take on. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Samath, there. That's, um, you know, a, uh, it's about balance and it's about any, yeah. and, and infection that being avoided in this patient population, you know, it's devastating. It can be a, a kind of a, a life-ending event for some of these kids. So, um, yeah, I, I, I really like this technique for well-selected patients. I'm a, I'm a little bit more uncertain about it in ambulant patients, to be honest. Um, you know, I think that's something that's really hard to dissect out, but. Uh, when you're looking at fixation to say L5, like my case versus the pelvis, you know, one factor that I always kept in mind was that going to the pelvis can take your borderline occasional walker to a non-walker, but it was highly variable. Yep. What's your experience with that, you know, with these kids? Have you got patients that have walked a bit that have still been able to afterwards? And what's happening with the bipolar? 
in uh, that clinical scenario? Um, I personally haven't instrumented any walker into the pelvis in neuromuscular groups. So like CP, uh, GMFCS1 or 2, um, I haven't had that experience. But my colleagues who had, um, their complication rate was a bit higher, especially for the uh, tannet and the pelvic junction. So uh, one of my colleagues did that um, and had a, a rod fracture. They had to go back in and revise. Uh, but I personally haven't had any experience with going to the pelvis. I agree. If you if you have a walker neuromuscular, you have to be very careful going to the pelvis. That's my opinion. But Dr. Milad has been instrumenting patients to the pelvis, uh, even in the walkers, and he's been very happy with that. That's his experience. Hey, Subak, we've got a couple of questions here. Got one from uh, Karim Kantar, who's uh, currently okay. Feroz Miyagi's fellow in Vancouver. And, uh, and Karim's an Australian uh, spinal surgeon who's uh, been doing some uh, excellent overseas fellowships. Um, he said, uh, hi, C-Mac, thank you for a great presentation. Do you uh, use the the uh, NEMOS for patients with no growth left? So like an older 14, 15 year old kid, I suppose. Um, or do you do uh, uh, fusion? Yes. So what would you lean towards for the older kids? Just saying they're still flexible, because I think having some flexibility is a is an important uh, part of this. So um, the other thing that the NEMAS does is that it allows the self adjustment. You can get the perfect uh, reduction on day one, and it's especially for the um, uh, older kids, I would say 14 or 15, the spine is very stiff and it's very hard to get all the reduction in one go. Whereas NEMAS can provide the self adjustment. I know uh, kids at that age probably stop the growth, but they still can self adjust their spine. So uh, I've been using the NEMAST for the um, almost adult um, as well. And I've had good results and I've seen Dr. Milady's results too, that they still have self-adjustment. They actually get a better correction, especially of the curvature of the spine and the pelvic obliquity afterwards. Um, so yes, there's no uh, age limit for putting a NEMAST in, but um, essentially the textbook answer is, I do that in a growing child. I've done one and two in the 15 and 16, and I've seen Dr. Milady doing that in the um, almost adult as well, or completely mature kids with great results. I think there was another question about uh, loosening of the screws. Yeah, from yeah. Melissa, she's um, she's got a question on, uh, on loosening of the pedicle screws as the rods grow. And I think that's a great question for the, uh, uh, in particular, the base of the construct, the, the tannin screw. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, essentially tannin is not a pedicle screw, it's oligosacral, and I have not had any loosening. That's that's the strongest screw. You, when, you can, when you put it in, that's the strongest screw if you've ever done. It's going through four cortices, and it's a super solid screw. I've not had any problem with that at all. No fracture, no screw loosening so far. Yeah. I mean, I think there's got to be applications there for adult spine correction when you go into the pelvis, but that hasn't quite been worked out yet. Um, I do think as well, you know, when you look at the early series from Australia, not yours, um, there have been some issues with uh, pelvic dysplasia in these kids and malposition of that screw that goes really towards S, the uh, apex of S1. And uh, I think the general advice would be fair to say, try to do it with navigation for that particular screw. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah navigation helped. And standard adult uh, spine, when I do, I use S2AI and sometimes pelvic bolts and a, a side connector. Whereas um, I found this oligosacral screw stronger. I haven't done a biomechanical study myself yet. I'm um, about to do one case in an adult that would like to use this NEMOST, um, sorry, the tannet screw in the bottom and join it with the rest of the pedicle screws. And so I'll let you know about the result of that. So I think that would be a good experience and see um, how much strength and the correction we can get because of the oligosacral screw rather than this 2AI. But personally, I haven't done a biomechanical screw a study uh, to see the strengths of the two. All right, now see, like Robert Wang's asked them, can you over ratchet with the Nemos uh, and how is it controlled? Um, you can't control it. Uh, over ratchet happens when the, uh, either the rod slides instead of the NEMOS itself. 
uh, or the growth is maxed out. And if that happens to case, you just need to uh, replace the NEMOS. I haven't had one yet, but I've, I've heard about the guys in Melbourne uh, and Dr. Miladi had to revise one, which is essentially is a quick operation to revise the um, lower part, which is the NEMOS part. Um, but you can't control the ratchet. No, it's not like magic um, or the traditional that you open up and distract. Once you put in, that will self-grow and it won't go back, it's one direction. No, that's excellent, Simak. I think it's a concept that uh, I think will gain increasing traction as there's more and more data out there. But uh, it's interesting to see regional differences in application at the moment. Uh, yeah, um, it was in Melbourne done that uh, last five years and they published a paper as well. Uh, Michael Johnson and Chris Landin, the main um, two front leaders. I've been doing that for the last three years in Paris WA. So I'm about to get all the results and hopefully you can uh, present it in um, uh, SRS in Barcelona this year. Very good. Yeah, when our abstracts due, I think February, is that right? February, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we better get writing. <laughs> yeah. February 1st, nobody forgets. Yeah, Ali knows. <laughs> Wonderful meeting Ali. in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's my plug for the SRS on behalf of the social media committee. <laughs> yeah. Ali's reviewing every abstract this year, right? So flood them in. So I'll stop sharing, Mike, and um, leave it to yeah. you. Cases. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Simak. That was, uh, I think, really good. And it's something we might come back um, and, uh, and look at again. Um, I'm just going to get my... Uh, my slides up here. I've got a couple of cases, just really quick ones to talk about. Um, let's see if I get this screen sharing working. Hey, can you guys see this okay? Yeah, we see back. You guys can yes. see this. Yeah, great. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is a, a six-year-old boy who came in a number of years back um, and uh, he had a really severe neck pain um, with both upper limb and lower limb paresthesia. He kind of came on spontaneously. He's a fit, active, otherwise normal child, uh, no major uh, medical comorbidities. He's uh, just been running around at, uh, at reception or you know, junior years of our, our primary school here and then got this really severe neck pain and said he was feeling a bit weak and funny um, no real fevers or sweats. Uh, he had a mildly elevated uh, temperature and a very mild elevation in CRP on some blood tests, but no obvious infectious source. Um, his lying down exam, his gross motor function's intact. He has some difficulty lifting his neck from the bed, but he can do it. Uh, his bladder and bowel function was intact, but he does have myelopathic signs present. Um, don't know if... Uh, uh, you know, it's a pretty straightforward that we're going to get some further imaging. I uh, don't think we have Wendy with us today, but uh, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and, and uh, see what they can see on that x-ray. Anyone on the chat, feel free to, to fire in. Looks like, Mike, uh, just from what I could tell here, there's some abnormality in the morphology of the vertebral bodies in the subaxial cervical spine. Um, I I'm not sure I appreciate any instability or, or unusual subluxations, but as a neurosurgeon, I will say this guy needs an MRI. Yeah, well, I think we could agree on that. Um, needs an MRI. Oh, we've got another question on the chat box as well from Anthony. Anthony, I'll come back to your question for uh, CMAC after this case. Um, sorry. Um, so we got the MRI. Oops, sorry. There we go. All righty. So this is the MRI and the CT scan. So in Australia, we can get everything. We've got no <laughs> limits to imaging, and we get them all pretty quick. They're usually pretty good in our hospitals here. So this is a, an urgent MRI and a CT scan. Now, um, I've got Ali and CMAC who are experienced spine surgeons here. I saw that my uh, 
previous fellow and outstanding colleague Karim is uh, is on the uh, meeting still. Um, I don't know, Amna, can you uh, unmute Karim and see if he can, uh, Karim Kanta, if he's there? But if anyone else on the, the chat box has got any ideas here, um, we'll see. Look, obviously, this is a pretty concerning image. This got sent to me out of the emergency department by our resident and uh, uh, went straight in so we had to cancel an operation that I was about to do and uh, and go and see this uh, this kid straight away so um I'll, I'll go to see Matt have you seen this before uh no I haven't to be honest yeah. no session experience no. so I mean to me this the the, the diagnosis here is uh, uh, um, always a concern for infection CRP was about 11 so it was pretty much normal um running a very mild temperature um, and there were no uh, other infectious signs um, and no real history of trauma. Um, I know Ali might have seen this before. Ali, uh, you know what the uh, the diagnosis here is? Yeah, I, I can't say I have uh, seen a lot of pathologies in kids, but, you know, I, I haven't seen this. But I, I can tell you, regardless of what it is, the treatment is going to be the same. Yeah, um, so... This is a, this, I saw these pictures and I thought, mm, um, I am going to uh, uh, probably need to do an operation on this kid. And so then I, I went and saw him at six years old. And uh, as I said, lying in the bed, his motor function was actually really good. He had some subtle myelopathic signs, a little bit of lower limb clonus, uh, an inverted brachioradialis reflex bilaterally in the upper limbs but actually neurologically was not nearly as bad as what these images show, which is fascinating. So um, like all complex pathologies, um, sometimes you need to call a friend and, and I did ask for some advice. Uh, I'll see, is, uh, is Karim on? Um, has Karim been released to talk to us? No, that's okay. I'll just go to the chat. Um, hey, Mike. Uh, uh, I, oh, I, Karim's I... there. He is excellent. Hey, Karim, <laughs> how, how are you are doing? Good to talk to you. <laughs> hey, have, have you seen this before? Do you remember uh, this patient? You might have even been the resident at the time. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, this was uh, circulated around our registrar group, and I think I, I think it's the same patient. Um, I've typed it into the group. I think this is a giant calcified cervical disc. Um, <laughs> and uh, if I and I won't I won't unfold the story, but I'm happy to keep, let you uh, <laughs> tell us a yeah. bit more about it. <laughs> So um, one of my uh, colleagues is a pediatric neurosurgeon um, and, uh, and spine surgeon, Catherine Cartwright, and she does scoliosis surgery. And uh, I gave her a call um, and went and looked at a few papers while I was driving in my car, which is probably not the right thing to do. Um, and look, this is a really interesting condition in that um, pediatric intradiscal calcification, so you see this within the disc is probably the precursor to this that you actually pick up with acute neck pain and mild fever in kids around this age for it then to herniate is really rare so this is a super rare presentation of the herniation of that calcific material but the reality is that it actually has the potential to heal without surgery and that's what the literature on this says now david skaggs has um, some advice on this in a paper on it i think and and he mentions that the majority do self-resolve so it took a lot of um, uh, fortitude to basically go in and put this kid in a pinless halo, put him on dexamethasone, uh, and watch him super closely in hospital, not going anywhere for a while. And I had all the corpectomy gear there ready to go um, because I thought that's what might be required. But, you know, putting a, a six-year-old through a corpectomy or, or even a posterior approach, you know, you're, you're up for a potential... Um, growth arrest and, and some real long-term issues and so there is a downside to that and his motor and bowel function was okay so obviously if he was not okay in those regards i would have immediate indication for surgery um but yeah with cortisone some rest and time um we got that's the uh, mr slice through there and in a pinless halo for uh, about three months Eventually, let him go to hospital. That's his follow-up MRI three months later. So we tapered his dexamethasone while he was still in hospital. His neurological function actually improved. And this is a three-month outcome. So I just thought if people haven't seen this before, it's worth having a look at it. 
uh, it uh, at this point, um, I'm pretty happy with this MRI. And uh, I've been following up this lad because it's Adelaide. Everyone knows everyone who goes to my boy's school. Um, so I see his parents around all the time. Um, and uh, uh, we've got him here. Um, so this is his five Mike, that's a great X-ray. result. That's, yeah. that's definitely a great outcome. Uh, just two real question, uh, two quick questions. Was the halo immobilization, was that for him, was that to prevent injury or was the thought that immobilization would uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, help in resorption of this disc? Yeah, that's what I figured. And it's a complete guess because there obviously aren't enough cases out there to really know what to do. But um, I, I guess that immobilization would, uh, I kept him in bed for a week, to be honest, and then slowly started him getting up and around. But I didn't want him to have all the complications of bed rest when he was clinically improving. And, and I think the um, bit of dexamethasone actually made a big difference as well. Uh, wow. You know, his neurofunction yeah, second, improved quick, in a couple uh, of days. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Just a quick follow up question. You know, let's say this it, the, he was six years old, correct? Six years old at the time. So yeah, let's say the kid 12. is, you know, 12, 13, 14 and wants to play sports. What do you say to the kid and the family about playing sports? Yeah, so I wouldn't let him play for at least a year or so. Um, I think the vertebral body morphology is abnormal. Um, C5 was abnormal, which is weird because it was like a C5, 6 disc. And the C5 that basically has a bit of a growth arrest. And I've got that if you go through here. You can still see that C5 is not entirely morphology, normal morphology at five-year follow-up. But I've done flexion extension views, and he's completely stable. So I've let him play. He's been playing Australian rules football the last three years. I kept him off for about an 18 months. But yeah, he's been playing contact sports with no problems. Cool. Now, thank you, Karim, for getting on there. Um, and uh, I thought it was good um, to show that case because it's a super rare presentation. So at least now you've seen it. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to run through quickly uh, uh, one more case. And then Ali's got a case as well. Um, but this is a, a patient of mine I did put up on LinkedIn. So you might have seen this before, but uh, this is a, a patient with uh, a 13 year old with quite progressive scoliosis and kyphosis. MRI has a normal neurological axis, uh, supreme artery, which is zero, close to radio. Sand is four with a leg length discrepancy of about two centimeters. These are side bending films. And this is a, a snapshot of the MRI as well as hand x ray. So, hand x ray, you can see uh, that the the distal phalanx growth plate is just open. So she's a Sanders 4, which means she's got a reasonable amount of growth left. White stiff curves. But one of the real factors here for me was this MRI is showing changes, abnormal disc changes, all the way down deep into the lumbar spine. But so including the 4 5 disc. So a lot of people would put their hand up and go, this is a fusion, you know, T3 to L4, T4 to L4. See, Matt, what would you do? Uh, yeah, for me it would be, how old is the child again? 13. 13. Yeah, I know what you do, Mike, but um, mm. I'll probably go T3 to L3. That's what I think. Try for really. L3. Do you, do you think yeah. going to L3 in this case, um, you know, you're going to have to do some anterior work to really level that vertebra? I'll probably watch it if it fails at the bottom level. I'll probably do anterior, but... Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, case. Case. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those disc changes at the base of the spine, if I go forward a bit as well, they're, they're kind of present up in the thoracic as well. Um, you know, this is a, I don't think this is normal idiopathic scoliosis. It's actually a, a fortunate, really rare combination of Sherman's, Sherman's. with a different, a, a different apex uh, of the kyphosis in the thoracic spine to the uh, scoliotic curves, which makes it incredibly challenging. It's got about a 60 degree thoracic kyphosis, 70 degree thoracic scoliosis, 65 degree lumbar. But what I did find is that those were suboptimal benders and that on the CT scan, the lumbar curve is actually coming down into the high 30s. So there's a bit more flexibility there than what, what is being shown. And if I go back a screen, even stopping at L3, which I think was my option for a fusion here, you know, I think that that's a hard situation, right? Because you've got Sherman's disc changes at L3-4 and L4-5. So you really, I think, any fusion procedure here setting the patient up for more work in the future. Now, um, you know, with what I did, I may well be doing that as well, but I thought I'd at least give it a go. I've, I've got fairly uh, adventurous with uh, 
tethering type procedures over the years. And I know that tethering is not going to deal with that kyphosis in the thoracic spine. So we've been looking at the hybrid concept of the thoracic fusion. Um, this is our uh, um, uh, setup for, for a fusion procedure for the thoracic spine. That's a section out here. I won't, I won't harp on this because I want Ali to present his case, but this is us using 7D light-based navigation to just get in and uh, get a pedicle screw entry. So there we go. But then you actually see on that CT that we've done, you can see the Sherman's type changes in the thoracic spine. This is us calibrating so the team can get the screws ready, just improves your workflow and efficiency. And then this is my fellow at the time, Sergio, putting his screws on his side. One of the joys of navigation is that you can really supervise your fellows well from the other side of the table. You know, you make them do freehand first, but then once you uh, you get that, you know, they, they go well with the navigation and uh, you need to keep an eye on them still, but usually they're pretty good. I like what you just said, Mike, about navigation. Just uh, I'm interjecting real quick. But a lot some some of our colleagues who are true purists with free hands, they don't like this uh, this expression. But I I call this really what 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 I do and what a lot of people who use nav do. I call it navigation assisted free hand technique. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what we try to do is make sure that you're getting your entry point before you look at the screen um, and you're getting a feel for what a pedicle feels like. So you can do this if the navigation isn't there or it isn't working. Um, you know, I like the nav burr as well for Pontes. I get most of the way there with the nav burr and then just finish the job with the kerosene now. So it really speeds it up a lot. Um, and this is where uh, uh, we've got... Um, just going through the system there. So this is just a flash fix. So we felt that it was inaccurate. So this is how quick the registration is with 7D, again, to just get uh, to get the accuracy back. And this is us working through. So we did that, and then I did a tether, and this is her first standing x-ray. And I was like, oh, no, this is bad. But the tethering process involves stripping involves stripping the psoas back, and they get a little bit of that dyssesthesia that you get, and I do go a little trans when I do this. So I split the anterior part so I can get my screws for anterior tethering, my second row of screws more posterior, so we're not being too kyphogenic. So of course, I was super worried when I saw this, but then I saw, okay, she's dropping her pelvis. She's flexing her left hip. This is kind of a muscle thing post-op, and I was really hopeful it will come good with time. So we've put her through a lot of physio, uh, a lot of uh, uh, scoliosis-specific exercise work. These are her films now with a hybrid fusion and lumbar tether at 12 months. So she's growing. We've got decent correction of her curve. She's still got some pelvic obliquity, which is driven by true leg length discrepancy and we'll probably get that sorted out with a little minor leg length procedure in the next few months. And I'm really happy with the overall shape of her spine. And at the moment, we've avoided a fusion deep into the lumbar spine. So I think this case is a bit out there. Uh, time will tell as to whether this was the right thing to do or not. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, it's just going to give a, a good result going into the future. Uh, yeah, Karim, unmute. Hey, Mike, uh, have you figured out a way to navigate these... Um these um, anterior tether screws? Um, I, because of the mobility of the spine, I haven't. I know that Noel yeah. Larson um, has described a way to do it. Um, uh, Noel, and uh, I'm going to give it a go with, uh, with Brain Lab, potentially, and, and surface point matching. Uh, yeah. But um, I haven't been able to do it with 7D. No. And I do think in some cases it could be helpful. Yeah. You're using a lot of fluoro. I mean, you've been there when we've done these cases, you know, where we're at yeah. several hundred fluoro shots, which isn't great for us, right? Um, yeah. The patients yeah. are, are probably okay. They're snapshots, not continuous screening. But um, yeah, it is something that I do think navigation can certainly assist with in the future. Good yeah. question. Yeah. Well, Mac, what do you think? Yeah, very Did I do nice the wrong thing, thing or do yeah. the right oh, thing? Beautiful. Good results. So you, so far. you exactly did so what far. you wanted to achieve. So patient is still growing, and you want to have that self correction by putting the tether in. I yeah. think that was it's very nice. Yeah, it's sort of like it's sort of like a nemos. It's working okay. 
Yeah, well, in the worst case scenario, you can convert that to effusion. You haven't been any breaches, so. No, I mean, there's a second surgery, but I think if you fuse this kid to L3 or L4, you may be up for that anyway in the next 10 to 15 years, which is not ideal. You know, they're only young. Right. So, um, yeah, there's no no right answers here. That hence the title. But, uh, yeah, got a few things on the chat. But what I'll do, Ali, did you uh, want to make a comment on yeah, this? Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, obviously, for, for, for the youngsters in the in the audience, this is not your textbook or your, your board answer to the question. But I love how novel it is. It's it's innovative. It's, you know, obviously combining the, you know, doing a hybrid hybrid technique. And I, and I think, you know, you, you know me, Mike. I mean, we I think that's the reason we share a lot of um, these same interests is that I think as long as you're not compromising safety, you have to think outside of the box a little bit and you have to push the envelope a little bit. Otherwise, we're we're going to do the same thing we did 40, 50 years ago. So I, I think it's really neat and uh, it'd be great to see the follow up in, uh, you know, in 12 to 24 months. Yeah, well, you know, another 12 months, I'll get the abstract in. Ali, you have to review it for SRS. Um, all right. Good. Well, Ali's got a case, so I'll just stop sharing mine um, now. And yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. You know, Ali. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Mike and and uh, uh, CMAC. I, I, honestly, I, I don't have any cases. I have a few slides because uh, okay. your guest really, uh, like I said, inspired me and took me down memory lane. Uh, I was very, Where's very it? pleased, very pleased to see this uh, this uh, pre this topic. So I'm going to just show some pictures from uh, uh, from my time with Dr. Miladi. Uh, CMAC, what, what year were you there? Uh, I was there just before COVID, so uh, 2000 and, um, towards the end of 2018, 2019. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, I, I think I was there uh, a few years uh, before. Let me see. Uh, In the kids. <laughs> you see that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that so that so I was I actually spent uh, two months there, June and July in 2015. So you'll recognize this. This is the uh, Necker Children's Hospital in uh, in Paris, and uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, casting. One of the first things I saw for the first time in my life was was uh, you know casting toddlers and infants. And as a nurse surgeon, I thought this was like torture device. I was like, I can't believe you guys are doing this to babies, <laughs> you know. Um, and I and I said, you know, I'll probably never do this, but it's great. It's really great to see it as a neurosurgeon who primarily treats adult, but has, uh, you know, uh, some some pediatric practice and some interest in pediatrics. I thought it was important to see that once. Um, and then here we are in the OR doing the uh, the bipolar technique that that you mentioned. And, and I think it really caught, like you mentioned, it, it caught me off guard. It's the first time I really saw something like this i mean i'm aware as you especially as as, as all of you orthopedic surgeons the uh, the iliosacral screw that's common in, in ortho trauma but this was really neat because it combined the iliosacral screw with your traditional you know sacropelvic fixation and i always wondered why uh, you know we'll talk about this offline but i always wondered why this didn't pick up in the us because it's such a nifty clever uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, technique, and uh, this picture on the left actually is a, is is a, you know is an illustration that, that Dr. Miladi gave to me. I, I have it some. I took a picture of it, but I have the paper here in in my office somewhere. I was trying to get it, but I was really really impressed with uh, uh, with this technique. Uh, I spent two months with him. He would you know he used this technique very liberally. I have to admit, which is which is understandable, right? When you're trying to assess what you can do and how far you can push a new technique. But he used this liberally in neuromuscular in uh, um, you know, a lot of different curves. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, I wasn't there long enough to see the long-term outcomes and whether these auto fuse or not, but it'd be great to see subsequent papers from your group and others who do this procedure, you know, what happens in terms of auto fusion and, uh, and the need to necessarily, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, transform or revert to a definitive fusion. We can certainly talk about that now or, or on a different time. But uh, yeah, this was great. This was this was the picture outside of the apartment we rented for a couple of months. And oh, nice. uh, it, it gave me an opportunity to tell some of the younger folks here, you know, really good idea to visit other surgeons, even if it's for a month or two, especially in other places, other countries, other continents. Uh, it's good to get out of your bubble because you'll just see something that's so different. 
And uh, I'll be honest, I, I I thought I would never see this again. Uh, and I'm so glad that you are our guest today. And I get to see some of those cases that reminded me of uh, of my time there. So I, I just wanted to take a few minutes uh, to, to show those. And uh, uh, obviously, thank you for presenting. It's a it's a great technique. And I hope it, pick, it keeps uh, picking up around uh, around the world. No, pleasure. Pleasure to have me. I actually, out of interest, went back to uh, Paris about a year ago. And he was doing a revision in one of these. And once we open up the spine, you could see exactly bone overgrowth the whole yeah. rod. So they actually autofuse to answer your question. But that's obviously anecdotal. I haven't done my Yeah, that's what I figured, right? I mean, yeah. not unlike any other growing rod technique in a, in a you know, in a growing spine, you, you just you get a certain percentage of them that autofuse. Yeah, well, thank exactly. you so much. Thanks so much for being our guest today. Mike, I'll give you the last word to close it up. Yeah, Ali, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, CMAC. I think it's a fascinating technique. I think it's good to get it out there for a wider audience. And obviously, you're doing great things with it uh, over in Perth and also our colleagues in Melbourne and Sydney that do them as well. Um, yeah, um, and it's just fascinating. You know, the world is a small place. Ali's already uh, been there and seen it. So, uh, you know, if anyone has, Ali's done it. He knows it. He's a globalist. He's all over the world. And um, yeah, thank you for. Uh, Karim uh, in Vancouver with Froze Me Angie at the moment for coming on and, and answering a few questions. Um, I think next week we're still working out the topic, what it's going to be. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thanks, Simac, again. Uh, if you've got any questions, fire them at us at, at LinkedIn afterwards. And thanks for everyone for joining the chat. So uh, we'll uh, we'll shut that down now and uh, we'll put on the socials what's happening next week. We're just not quite sure yet. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.